Do natural history museums present the truth about origins? Watch our Genesis Impact movie to see a young Christian successfully challenge a museum docent on the leading evidences for evolution. Oh, 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 so it's a, a fantasy film because that's the only way that'll happen. Now in closing today, we've seen that the earth has gradually changed over millions of years and that the continents have drifted. Radiometric dating has solidly established that the Earth is billions of years old, leaving plenty of time for the engine of evolution, natural selection, and mutation to drive evolutionary progress. Despite the fact that this is worded so poorly, it is essentially correct. The reason this movie was made was to counter this opening statement, because no matter how solidly established, facts have no weight or importance to those who want to deny reality in whole or in part to make believe something else instead. Virtually everything the young earth creationist preacher, excuse me, the museum docent that the preacher is playing, everything this character says after this point is dubious at best. Now, Charles Darwin may have discovered the key principles of human evolution that we base these principles on, but it is my hope that you, the next generation, would take these theories and continue to help us prove just how evolution happens. Notice how this straw man of a supposed scientist describes science as if it's a belief system where we need to prove these theories rather than test them because he thinks a theory is a mere guess, just blind and baseless speculation like his own position is rather than the body of knowledge in a field of study that we know that scientific theories really are. He doesn't acknowledge that there's any reality to evolution because there's no reality to creationism, and he needs to create the illusion of equivalence, as if we have a choice between two equally valid options that are both empty, vacuous beliefs, when really this is simply a matter of fact versus fiction. He says, we have principles that we base our principles on, the same way that believers have assumptions that they base assumptions on. That's the circular reasoning of the question-begging fallacy, which is ubiquitous throughout all religions. But that's not allowed in science. Science is an investigation, not a belief. So it works completely opposite of faith. Instead of simply believing whatever you're told by some authority and being forbidden to question that because religion will charge you with heresy, blasphemy, or apostasy, in science there are no authorities, and you're encouraged to question whatever you're taught and to test it. Apply doubt, not just to that one position or assumption, but to all competing ideas as well, to show which ones are better supported. And those that are not supported at all don't even warrant further consideration. That's what creationists are upset about. Their fairy tales have no facts and evidence at all and are thus indefensible, like bringing a spork to a gunfight. Science doesn't allow empty assertions on faith, which is all religions have because everywhere outside of religion, that would be considered lying. Thus, to keep us honest, every postulation must be based on supportive evidence. And to stay on the right track, all of it has to be testable and potentially falsifiable, meaning that there has to be some way to show whether it's wrong, if it is, so that we don't waste our time going up you know, the wrong direction for no reason. These two polar opposite approaches are the reason why faith divides into multiple religions, each further fracturing into myriad denominations and subsects and minor cults and so forth. Faith starts out with a faulty assumption, often labeled as a dream, erroneously interpreted as divine revelation, and each new heretical variant adds more of their own imagined embellishments on top of that. So that they all start out wrong and just keep getting wronger over time, branching blindly in every direction with every intra-contradictory faith claiming a different set of untestable assertions, lies, to be sold as absolute truth with a capital T, even though they contradict each other. And when we're talking about absolute truth, then logically only one of these many derivations of different denominations of violently conflicting religions even could be right, meaning that all of the rest of them are wrong. And it's infinitely more probable that they're all wrong, especially since so many falsehoods exist in every single doctrine, and none of them can show that they have any truth to them at all. Because they don't. If any of them could show that they were any truer than all the others, then there wouldn't be all these others, now would there? But faith is not based on logic or reason like science is. 
Whereas, regardless of whatever doctrine you started from and whatever mutually exclusive collection of mythology you used to believe in that are now radiating out in every direction, growing further apart all the time, everyone who prioritizes science over faith, where applicable, will follow the facts to go the other way, to come together and hone in on the same one and only actual factual truth of the matter. Now with that, I'll open up the floor and any questions you may have. Okay, well, thank you for your time, and enjoy the museum. I think the reason no one had any questions for the docent was that the director of this film wants to give the impression that everyone in the audience is either an unquestioning believer, because they want to make evolution seem like another religion. That's why they refer to those who accept science as evolutionists. That's why they call it evolutionism. That's why the docent is played by a preacher. That's why the setting for this natural history museum was actually apparently filmed inside his church. It's all part of the same attempt at deception. Otherwise, I expect that the director intended that his audience, both the extras in the movie and the real people watching at home, imagined that the only questions anyone would have for an evolutionist would be if they knew enough to challenge evolution, because they don't want to understand it. They don't want to learn forbidden knowledge. They want someone to give them some excuse, any excuse that will let them make believe in something else, which is when we meet the antagonistic protagonist of this story. Sir, I have a question. Well, quite a few questions, actually. Uh, okay, go ahead. Uh, ask away. Well, you mentioned that one of the leading evidences that humans evolved from an ape-like ancestor is that human and chimp DNA is 98% similar. Why do believers always pluralize the word evidences? They all do that, and they're the only ones who do. But that word is plural already. It's the body of evidence, the facts in evidence, not evidences. And notice also how the audience is interested that someone dared ask the docent a question, as if everyone else was afraid to. And they think that anyone doing so must be something to see, because they were taught in church that questioning authority is naughty and a sin against faith. Uh, yes. Well, how big is the human genome? How many base pairs? Well... The exact figure varies uh, over the years, but the last count was 3.097 billion base pairs. And how about chimps? Uh, the last count was 3.231 billion. Okay, so chimps have about 134 million more base pairs than we have, which means their genome is about 4.3% bigger. How is it possible to say that our DNA is like 98% similar when actually it's 4.3% bigger? Well, for one thing, they have a whole other chromosome that we don't. Because sometime after our lineage diverged from the one leading to chimps, our ancestors experienced a chromosomal fusion, where two of their chromosomes fused into one in us. The science denialists won't even attempt to explain the evidence for that. They just ignore it. But that one fact alone can account for a lot of this apparent differences, though there are one or two other similar factors we know of that could account for that as well. Hi, my name is Erica. I go by Gutsy Gibbon on YouTube. I am a biological anthropology PhD student currently. I got my master's of research in primate biology behavior and conservation, and I got my BSA in pre-professional animal science with minors in biology and anthropology. And what I do is I study primates, extinct, living, and humans included. The, the issue here is, is that the human and chimp genome are different sizes, right? We can still compare them. Humans and humans, like within our own species, we differ slightly in the size of our genomes, right? Like it's like a percent of a percent, but we still do differ in the size of our genomes. To this point, I don't think any creationists would, for example, take issue, take, take problem with the idea that we can compare dogs and wolves using, using their genomes, and yet their genomes are different sizes. Same things with cats and lions or African and Asian elephants. All of them, all of these pairs have different sized genomes, and yet it's only with the human and chimp, which are actually closer in size than some of those pairs, that they actually seem to take issue with. Um, 
we we can talk more in a second as as we sort of move forward on the um the the methods of the methods that we use within genetics to actually compare genomes in comparative genomics, but it suffice it to say it's not a problem that the genomes are different sizes and creationists don't typically have a problem with it just when it interferes with their worldview. Understood. In an argument with Kent Hovind, uh, he was arguing about how. how dogs and or bears and seals cannot be related because bears have this number of chromosomes and seals have this other number, number of chromosomes. They're off by two. But butterflies are all related even though they have a chromosomal variance of hundreds. Same same with um, with gibbons, right? Gibbons have, uh, I believe it's something like 22 to 52 chromosomes, right? They're all gibbons. And I don't think that Ken Ho I think Ken Holman would say exactly that. Well, they're all gibbons. They're all apes, right? Five-year-olds would tell you they're all the same kind. <laughs> <laughs> a, yeah, a five-year-old could tell you they're all the same kind. Um, and I really, I think this is fascinating as well, because like donkeys and horses differ in their chromosomal number as well. And creationists don't have a problem with this. They selectively invoke uh, issues with methodology whenever it's sort of suitable or beneficial to to them in the case that they're trying to make. But as as always is the case with creationists, they cannot apply, they can't apply it unilaterally like across across the animal kingdom or it starts to become an issue. Well, when they made the comparison between our genome and theirs, uh, they were so different that they had to break them apart into chunks that were similar, and then the comparisons were made. Notice that he doesn't explain what he's talking about. Instead, he says they were so different as to imply that they're incomparable, not related at all, which of course is what he wants you to believe. But we have to consider the fact that not all mutations are point mutations that only change a single coda, like changing the spelling of a word in a sentence. That might have a profound effect if it happens in the fraction of DNA that is regulatory or coding, but the vast majority of our genome is neither. As some mutations duplicate or delete large sections of DNA all at once, like tearing whole pages out of a book or adding pages that are just copies of the previous pages, or in some cases, copies of copies. To put that another way, when you compare both whole genomes, there are places where they match up exactly, up to a point where one genome suddenly has an extra page of information up to that certain point again where it resumes that perfect match again for hundreds of codons at a stretch, showing that this block was deleted from that other genome. Or you go on with a perfect match for hundreds of codons at a time until one of the two genomes just repeats that whole section all over again with an exact copy, and then after that it continues on for another long stretch of a perfect match of hundreds more codons. There's actually a higher percentage of our genome that was corrupted by endogenous retroviruses than were identified for coding or regulation combined. So these major block mutations usually have no impact on our biology whatsoever. But it means that measuring all of our DNA in a linear fashion based on something as simple and irrelevant as the total number of base pairs is unrealistic to say the least. If we want to understand what we're looking at, then we have to eliminate whole block mutations and things like endogenous retroviruses over the course of the last six million years when our medical history diverged from that of chimps. We want to understand the reality, which I realize is never what religion ever wants to do, but scientists know that we have to compare the parts that matter. How much of the human and chimp genome do they live out? Well, when they came up with the 98% similarity figure, they excluded 25% of the human genetic material and 18% of the chimps. Isn't that called cherry picking? <laughs> well, you may see it that way. It sure seems like it to me. I'm sorry, sir. I didn't mean any disrespect. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. I just, I've been doing a lot of research and I'm really fascinated by all this. That's another lie. She isn't fascinated. She has no interest in this at all. She wants the fantasy, not the fact. Reading only one-sided sensationalism from propaganda mills like Answers in Genesis does not qualify as research, because those are the ones who are guilty of cherry-picking and confirmation bias and poisoning the well, as well as arguments from ignorance and incredulity and every other form of logical fallacy, both formal and informal, in an attempt to defend the indefensible against all reason. You know, no need to apologize. I like it when people do a little critical thinking. Thank you, sir. I, I like when people do critical thinking as well. I don't think that's what's going on here. <laughs> well, how similar are the human and chimp genomes when the entire genome is compared without cherry picking like that? 
Yeah. So when we do genetic comparisons, like genomic comparisons between humans for things like paternity tests, we don't literally use the full genome either. We compare highly variable regions because much of the genome is conserved within and between species. So there's there's that little number there, which explains why this was done. But moreover, the to my understanding, the entirety of the, the functional portion right, of the human and chimp genome has been compared. And, and that's where we're 98.8 percent similar. When we're looking at non-coding, so the full genome, uh, you know, excluding um, like short tandem repeats and things like that, I believe it's short tandem repeats, we're about 96% similar. So these are the two numbers that tend to float around. And oh, he's so sorry, sick. sorry. He's just you trying can't to say protect. anything because he won't stop barking. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the long and short of it is, is that the, uh, the, the methodology is appropriate and it's consistent. That's how we do it when we compare humans. That's how we do it when we compare other species. And again, to emphasize, they don't seem to have an issue with this when we're, when we're doing comparative genomics between, say, rats and mice. It's only the human and chimp part that they, that they get upset about. Well, when the researchers factor in the non-similar data into the comparisons, the similarities were only between 66% and 86%. That's a lot less than 98%. Doesn't sound very similar to me. Well, they recently resequenced the chimp genome, and the technology's getting better. So what did the new study show? Let's see. Uh, uh, okay, well, here it is. Based on the new data in 2018, they now say the human and chimp DNA similarity is a maximum of 84% but it says they didn't include the areas of human and chimp DNA that could not be matched up. So hmm, the actual estimate is lower. So we went from 98% similarity to 84% maximum similarity between the comparable regions, plus the chimp genome is 4% bigger? Evolutionists claim that 98% similarity figure supported their idea of humans branching off because they were so close. With the 84% maximum similarity figure, there would obviously be way too many genetic changes to make within their supposed six million year timeline when humans supposedly branched off. I mean, we're talking hundreds of millions of additional changes above what their 98% estimate would equate to. Okay, so um, notice there's no citation there. I couldn't see any citation, but to my understanding, this is a direct reference to Tompkins 2018. Now, what Tompkins did is he compared uh, a bunch of different contiguous regions of the genome of a recently published draft of the chimpanzee. Um, Pantroph 6 is the name of the sort of most recent sequence that's been published. And he publishes this 84% as if it's the, you know, sort of end all be all of, of the comparisons, as if now that we've managed to, to run the chimp human comparison with a, a chimpanzee genome that has not been created using a human scaffold, that this is the true similarity. And there are a great many, um, issues with this. So I've looked at Tomkin's methods here and his 2018 methods. I'm gonna to explain to you very quickly why they are just abhorrently bogus in a way that even his earlier methods didn't manage to didn't manage to broach. So what Tompkins does, and he publishes this himself, so you yourself can see this if you go to his 2018 paper, you go to his supplementary material, he publishes it on GitHub, so you can see. He'll have his percent identity, which is 98% across the board for these contiguous regions. Then what he does is he calculates a percent identity by averaging all of the matches, right? Not the, not the percent identity divided by the length of the match, just the percentages of the match. And that's how he gets 84%. So what this means is that this is like having a student take, um, take a course, right? And in this course, they have 100 little quizzes that are worth five points each. And they managed to get a 100 on all of these little quizzes. And then they flunk the big exam. This would be like weighting all of those little tiny quizzes and the final exam exactly the same instead of weighting them. Tompkins doesn't weight his method or weight his, his percent similarities. So what this means is that when he, when he has a chimpanzee and human comparison, let's say it's 300 base pairs long. So when I say base pair, I'm talking about the, the nucleic acids, uh, adenine, thymine, uh, guanine, and cytosine. So he has a, a section of DNA that's 300 base pairs long, right? If that 300 base pair section is only 50% similar, 
that is weighted exactly equally with a 300,000 base pair segment that is 100% identical. That's how he gets that 84% number. And anybody can go look this, go see this for them for themselves on his own published data. He just knows no one will check. But I checked, and Glenn Williamson, Ruhif checked. And it's it's absolute nonsense. And yet, and this is God, this is the problem, Aaron, because this is in a documentary movie, quote unquote, that's been published and viewed by what I assume at least hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. No one will know. None of these people are exposed to the fact that his methods flunk first year pre-algebra, right? They, they flunk pre-algebra in high school. He, he, he's not even waiting his sequences, it's that, which is insane, right? So what, what's fascinating is that, and, and I'll, I'll reveal this um, now, the, the punchline will come uh, in a couple of weeks once I fully finish with all my methods, but I'm running all, both of Tompkins' methods, his 2013 methods and his 2018 methods to see for myself what happens when you run these comparisons that he's used with his published parameters and blast what happens when you run those methods comparing say two humans or you know a, a dog and a wolf or a bonobo and a chimp or you know what have you and what i will tell you is that i'm at least finished with the with the human chimp comparison and i ran the human chimp comparison with the fully published pantro 6 um genome, the reference genome for Pantro 6. That is the Pantroglodytes, the scientific name for chimpanzees, published without a human scaffold, the full thing released. Now, Tompkins only used a couple of the published um, contiguous sequences. So he, he used like, I think it's like 80,000 or 18,000 contigs, something like that. I'm comparing the whole thing, unmasked, right? So the, the full deal. And when I compare that to the human genome, the human reference genome, with both of them being unmasked and both of them being the the full comparison i get 98.8 percent for coding and 96 for non and that's that's what you'll notice what they said in that and i'm going to publish all of this um on youtube but hopefully in, in a means by which anybody can download my data so they can cross check me peer review me if you will um I would publish this in a in a in a real journal, but since people don't care what creationists have to say, everybody would be like, "Well, yeah, duh, right? <laughs> you don't need to publish that. Everybody knows it already." I'm publishing what everybody. I would be publishing what everybody already knows. Um, but what I would like is I would like for people to appreciate the the error of Tompkins's methods here and how deceptive this documentary was by saying once the full genome was sequenced, you, you know, without using the full human scaffold and and blah 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 then we get 84% false, categorically false. And in fact, just to be sure, I did the, the Pantro 6 human comparison and I compared that to the Pantro 3 human comparison. That's an earlier reference genome, earlier draft of, of the chimpanzee chromosome. They're about point, like, I think it's like 0 0.2 to 0.6% different. Um, not, not very much at all. Uh, that that was brilliant. That was well beyond my capacity on you know my channel. So I'm really glad that you're involved in this. Well, Aaron, I, I mean, I'll tell you, like I did it because no one else did, right? I, I had to sit down. I had to learn Blast. Ruhif Glenn Williamson helped me a lot. My my husband, who works with computer uh, programming and things like that, he helped me a lot. But we basically sat down. We downloaded all of the reference genomes that Tompkins used. We even downloaded the specific contigs that he used and ran it using the just to make sure we were getting his methods right. Um, and and hopefully, I'm gonna I'm gonna publish a big a big piece on this here in, in the next couple of weeks because. You know, I'll, I'll tell you, like, it's if this sounds bad, what I've said here, it gets worse. Um, Tompkins's methods are so wholly inappropriate that it is it is going to be very, very embarrassing for any of the creationist organizations who have touted that number simply because it's not wrong in a worldview sense. It's wrong in a math sense, which is not good. Tompkins is doing a bait and switch. Right, so the way that he gets, I guess I should clarify, there are a couple of ways that you can get a lower percentage than 96%. Um, you can count up the differences like as each new, as each base pair being a separate difference. But the problem when you do that is like, let's say I have two books, right? Let's say I have two copies of Great Expectations and one copy has a duplication of an entire page. Obviously, if you count up the differences on page number, it's going to be a different percentage than if you count it off base of letters, right, with a duplication of a page at the end. So there are ways to do this, but the problem is, is that it scales, right? So if you do the comparison 
counting every single base pair as a difference, you might be able to get the, the similarity between humans and chimpanzees lower than 96%, except the difference between chimpanzees and gorillas will scale with that. Humans and chimps will still be most closely related to one another. And the worst part is for Answers in Genesis, Genesis Apologetics, all of these guys, is that the human-human gap will also widen because humans differ in our genomes. If you count every single base pair as a percent difference, as a, a portion of the percentage difference, then we're not gonna be 99.9% .9 similar to one another. We're just not. So every gap widens if you do it by counting every single base pair um, as a difference, which is why most geneticists don't do it that way. They consider when entire regions are duplicated, they appreciate that as, as a singular as a singular event. But what Tompkins does is particularly nefarious and what this documentary is doing is particularly nefarious because the means by which you get that lower percentage for humans and chimps, right? Uh, Richard Buggs usually reports like 86, 84%, something like that for every single base pair being different, which is kind of within Tompkins' range, but they, they kind of overlap for non-methodological reasons, which that's a long story. But Richard Buggs counts every base pair um, as different, that's fine. Like I said, that's gonna make every gap wider, which means humans and cows, humans and mice, humans and cats, whatever, all of those are going to expand outwards. It's going to be 70, 60% similar, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and when you do it that way, them within their own species groups are going to be different as well. So two different hybrid cows, Bos indicus and Bos taurus are going to be like 80% similar, even though they're, they're, um, they're hybrids. So the way that you actually calculate these differences matters. And no matter how you do it, humans and chimps are the most similar to one another. We are more similar to chimps and chimps are more similar to us than either of us is to any other animal. At least that's the canon. So the bonobos are the same. They fall to the same category. Tompkins is comparing in this documentary is comparing the, the normal conventional science method, which is how we get 96% of humans and chimps, they're applying that method to humans versus cows, mice, et cetera, and comparing that to a completely different, every single base pair is a difference methodology for humans and chimps. It's completely different methodology that they're comparing to make it look like there's not a relationship between humans and chimps, and it's incredibly dishonest. So this guy Thompson, uh, Tompkins, is he a creationist? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That, yeah. that, well, that explains why he's lying in his research. Yeah, a hundred percent. And like, I'll, I'll tell you, like, you know me, Aaron, like I, I try to, um, I try to assume the best in people and give people the benefit of the doubt, perhaps more than I should. I've been told by other people, but like, I've looked, I've read pretty much everything Tompkins has ever put out at this point, And I am having a very hard time wrapping my head around this being accidental. Um, in fact, I've kind of got a pet theory uh, going right now that he sat down with, you know, a, a high powered computer so he could run every kind of possible comparison in order to maximize the differences. I think that that's what he's done. Um, Richard Buggs is an, uh, he, he is an actual biologist. He's, um, you know, an interesting guy. He's usually cited as the guy that corroborates Tompkins's work. And Richard Buggs, interestingly enough, published in 2020. So he's he's usually cited as being on forums and things like that, offering the 84, 86% on that single base pair difference method um, and saying, you know, kind of offering a justification for that and appreciating that this does indeed widen the gap between all organisms. But his publication in 2020 is particularly interesting because it offers up a new way of comparing organisms by, by doing, I believe it's called chromosomal mapping or something along those lines. Uh, and you'll never guess what the similarity between humans and chimps using his new method is. It's 96%. 2020, the most recent thing from Richard Buggs, the most recent thing he's put out there. Um, so I think it's safe to say that uh, we're, we're sitting with Tompkins, has no one in his corner with his weird 80% number. And everybody else is sitting over here with like, yes, it's, it's 96 for full genome. It's 98.8 .8 for coding. Yes, but the fact remains that we share many similar genes with apes. Wouldn't you agree? Well, yes. But we also share many similar genes with other mammals because we have similar metabolisms and biochemistries. It's a basic engineering principle. Common code doing a similar purpose. I mean, I could even pull up a National Geographic website with a gene calculator that shows me I'm 88% similar to a mouse, 85% similar to a cow, and 84% similar to a dog. Let's assume that her reported numbers are correct. 
I don't think they are because I've seen different numbers and I can't find the gene calculator that she mentioned. I wish the wanna believers would provide citations, but it's obvious why they don't. Forgetting for the moment that there are several different species of mice and cattle and canids and that we should expect to find as much genetic variance between, say, the African painted dog and the South American maned wolf or the Asian raccoon dog as there is between humans and chimpanzees, let's explore this basic engineering principle that she's talking about, but as an autonomous process without an engineer. It's not surprising that mice are more similar to humans than dogs or cattle, because dogs and cattle are both Laurasia therians, while mice and apes like us are both Eurocontagliers. And all four of us are Boreoeutherians, which means that we should be more genetically similar to each other than any of us are to elephants, manatees, anteaters, or armadillos, because they're all in a separate clade of placental mammals called Atlanta genata. Because they didn't just compare genomes of a few random animals one to the other. By now, they've pretty well mapped the whole tree collectively, revealing a vast network of evident relationships. And just look at this genetic chart illustrating placental mammal diversification in the late Cretaceous tertiary boundary, wherein they compared both mitochondrial and nuclear DNA sequences for all these families against the molecular clock to show their divergence. We have similar charts not just for virtually every group of mammals, but for most other groups of butterflies and lizards and birds and practically everything else, where every one of hundreds of genetic studies of different aspects of zoology and botany and microbiology all strongly reinforce taxonomic relationships consistently throughout, without fail or contradiction. That is the fact that the science-denying wanna pretenders are trying to dismiss and ignore. I'm glad that the Christian girl admitted that humans are mammals, but she doesn't realize that we share a substantial amount of our genome with other taxonomic classes and even kingdoms. The further down the phylogenetic tree you go, the more genetically dissimilar we'll be. But it's not constant, because the more distantly related we are, the more of our fundamental genetic structure is conserved and shared in common with most other animals and plants and everything else. Nearly all of the measurable difference between us and anything else is in that last half, the top 50%. For example, we have 60% similarity with everything from fruit flies to bananas. Most of the first half of our genome is held in common with everything else alive. Between humans and chimps, we're looking at virtually identical coding DNA where nearly all the differences are in non-coding DNA. And why is that? Well, one of my biology teachers was a Christian geneticist working for the Human Genome Project. She told me that the evidence for taxonomic relationships is overwhelming when you look at the comparisons between the genomic sequences of both closely related and even distantly related species. The DNA of yeast and humans share over 30% homology with regard to gene sequences. Comparison of the human and mouse genome shows that only 1% of the genes in either genome fails to have an ortholog with the other genome. Comparison of non-gene sequences, on the other hand, shows a huge amount of divergence. And this type of homology can be explained only from descent from a common ancestor. Not just because the degree of homology or genetic similarity is high, but because of the specific signatures of selection. You really seem to know your stuff. You know, most people, they hear that 98% figure. They have no idea about its limitations or where the figure even came from. Yes, and because the mantra has been quoted so long in so many places, most people just accept it as proof for evolution. Is, is that not, is that not with, with all that we've said here, with all we've discussed so far, is that not the most ironic thing you've ever heard? Someone parroting the Tompkins number saying that no one has ever given the percentage of 98.8 any thought? When this is someone who doesn't even know that that 84% from the 2018 paper comes from improperly weighting sequences, something anyone can check because it's all publicly available, greatly concerning. Well, it's not like the faithful are going to check, right? They want a reason to believe in their preferred delusion, even if they know it's not a good reason, and they'll defend that belief against all reason. Now, I've heard it said that believers lie to themselves while apologists lie to others, and that's why they made this movie. 